Really happy to be here with Vix Anderton. We're going to be talking about perfectionism. Vix has written a book about it. She has uh, coaching and mentoring and uh, group programs around this kind of thing. And uh, just really, uh, this is a wonderful topic. I think it's going to resonate with a lot of the people watching and listening. And thank you, Vix, for being here. And I'll let you introduce yourself uh, and share with us anything you'd like about your background and why you love uh, working on this topic. Oh, thank you, George. Thank you for having me. Um, so I am an embodiment coach for recovering perfectionists, overachievers, athletes, and um, to do with people is support them back into connection with their somatic wisdom as well as their intellectual wisdom, um, their rhythms and cycles, and then the people around them. And so for me, that's the kind of the three components that helps people live uh, more authentically to turn the volume down on the inner critic and um and still be able to get stuff done in the world that was really important i think yeah. um so yeah i i care a lot about nervous system regulation that feels like really foundational for me and then i work with uh embodied coaching techniques a lot of authentic relating and and cyclical living and i think it's also really important for me to say that i am a recovering perfectionist um so <laughs> this work is very much uh, drawn from yeah from from my journey and figuring out how I could be in relationship with my perfectionism differently yeah absolutely absolutely yeah thank you just give me one moment here all right so um this is uh, this is so interesting because perfectionism usually um I don't know people often think of it either as a, a character flaw you know they're stuck with it for life or it's like something they have to work really hard on. And they when they work on it, it's like a mental thing. They just have to like, it's either a mental thing or they just have to like pull themselves up by their bootstraps and just like get on with it kind of thing. Um, and I and you have a much more like holistic and, and kind of deeper view on this stuff. So um, wherever you want to start with it, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm curious about two things. The, the, the idea that is it a character flaw and... Um, and secondly, how does it connect with the embodied experience? Yeah. Well, well, firstly, I mean, I think this approach of like perfectionism being something I have to overcome or I have to fix for me is perfectionist thinking in action. It's like, oh, if only I wasn't a perfectionist, then I would be good enough to do all the things I want to do. So yeah, I guess I'm trying to become as important. So no, I, I don't think perfectionism is a character flaw. I think it is a really normal human experience but I, I don't think I meet many people who don't have it come to them in some way shape or form and oh, especially I'm like, so sorry Vix I, I'm going to pause you for the we're, we're having a yeah. little bit of audio issues once one moment all right so we're gonna we're gonna now uh, have a different mic and hopefully it'll it'll be better <laughs> so start 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 over tell us again perfectionism isn't a character flaw to overcome what does that mean no no so I think so firstly, let me say, perfectionism, I don't think is the drive to be perfect. I think it is the story that <clears throat> I am not enough. Mm. And therefore I have to be different. I have to do more in order to, to feel like I'm, I'm enough to be safe, to be loved, to achieve the things that I want to in life. And I don't think that's a character flaw. I think it's a very normal human experience. I think it's a coping strategy that lots of us develop fairly young in life you know alongside people pleasing overthink you know there, there are all of these coping strategies are ways that we keep ourselves safe and uh keep ourselves loved and they work because our bodies are incredibly adaptive and if they didn't work we would have picked a different strategy so so what happens is but they become overdeveloped strengths because they work they're the thing that they become our go-to so the thing we keep practicing and become really, really good at them. And over time, it means that they become our only option. So for me, my perfectionism means that every time I'm in a new situation, my nervous system freaks out a little bit, which is where the embodied, you know, it's not a, this is not a mindset thing. Like this is like the neurophysiological, uh, uh, <laughs> I can't speak. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think we know body, what you mean, yeah. In my nervous system yes. to respond to, unsafe uncertainty discomfort mm. and unsafety 
And you can't bulldoze through that. That isn't something to overcome. Um, and like I said, the attempt to try and overcome it is your perfectionism in action. Really interesting. Really good. I love that. It's um, it well helps us accept ourselves, you know, our, ourselves more as we put it in this way, and mm -hmm. um, we appreciate that we have been trying to keep ourselves safe, keep ourselves accepted, mm -hmm. and um, we can appreciate that side of ourselves. Um, and yes, that means okay, it's worked up to now. And how can we, what can we do to make it work even better, I guess, without so much stress, without so much strain, right? Yeah. Yeah. The way I like to frame it is like, how could I have more choice? You know, because perfectionism means I only have one option and that's do better. So like, how can I have other ways of being, other ways of being embodied that give me more choice so that maybe in one situation I, I want to be able to to be more relaxed or more easeful or more joyful. But there might be lots of times when like, actually, no, this, like my perfectionist tendencies are actually really helpful right now. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, choice. And it's, yes, because it, w when I'm perfectionistic, there's only one choice, which is to make it more perfect, <laughs> which is to, which is to keep going until I'm no longer judging myself or until I collapse on the floor exhausted. And then I have to put this thing out there. Um, there's only one choice. And mm -hmm. so when you say that, that, that the way you approach this is to have more choice, it means, yeah. I could choose to put this thing out there. I can choose to send this thing. I can choose to publish this. I can choose to be done with this project at any stage along the way yeah. and not have to save some imaginary ideal end point. Because of course, <laughs> as a recovering perfectionist myself, I know there is no end point. It just keeps, yeah. <laughs> it just always, there's always ways to make it better. Okay. So I, I um, you mentioned the embodiment piece of it and I want to bring that in now because um yeah, I think a lot of folks watching this are are interested in it and or some of some are just learning about it and how important it is. How does perfectionism relate to I mean, you have studied embodiment and practiced it and and coached others with it for so long. Like how does it relate? How do these two things relate? Because usually when I hear of embodiment, like most people think, oh, yoga or you know, breathing or meditation. And it's like, it's like seen as a separate practice that like you just kind of like do it, you become a more well rounded person or more, you know, emotionally resilient or something like that. But to bring perfectionism into it, I thought was really interesting. Yeah, so for me, and there's something that I studied with Mark Walsh, um, who I know that is a friend of yours yeah. as well, yeah. that embodiment, embodiment, it, one way to think about it is it, it's how I am. Like it's the mm. the shaping that I have in any moment. It's my 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 biography is written into my body and how I hold myself, how I move. Um, and so bringing in body lens to perfection because there's two things: awareness, so I can notice when I'm in the pattern, and then choice, I can put my body in a different shape. And so for most perfectionists, I think perfectionism shows up in two embodied states. One is the kind of the sympathetic activation. So everything is forward focused. How do I grip the steering wheel harder? How do I do more? Tunnel vision kicks in. Like it's all about this. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm, there's a lot of tension in my pelvic floor. My gaze is really narrowed. It's harder for me to look at you. <laughs> you know, everything kind of comes in. And then the, the other way that um, uh, it can show up is more of a kind of a collapse. This sort of like, helpless oh I'm small oh no I, I can't do anything right like it's all hopeless how am I ever going to do anything again and this kind of like procrastinating inaction that kicks in and, I, and I'm, I'm exaggerating the, the movement there but I imagine most people can kind of resonate with one or both of those and so for me like when I'm kind of working with my perfectionism and I want to have more choice what I need to do is bring myself back to back to kind of center, back to a place where I can feel the back of my body. So I often coach with this like big cushion behind me because it means I can like relax back into my chair a little bit. So I'm not leaning too far forwards, but I'm also not collapsed back. And like, I have space in front of me, like I can do things. I still have agency, which I think is something that a lot of perfectionists think, 
oh, if I stop trying, if I stop being here, then I'm never going to get anything done because I'm going to lose all my ability to act. So there's something for me about being connected to my back body and and still being able to take action in front of me that feels like the right the right balance a lot of the time. That's brilliant. Yeah. And um, for me, like the word flexibility comes to mind. It's like um, the yeah, it's like you're you're working with your body to be more flexible. That makes it helps your mind state to be more flexible. And therefore yeah. you can, you can choose um, at what point you're completed with something. Um, if you're a goalkeeper in soccer, you know, if you saw a goalkeeper, like, yeah, oh, which way yeah, the ball right. gonna go? they're not going to be a very effective goalkeeper. Like goalkeepers right. are, are flexible, like they're limber, they're, they're responsive. So when something happens, they're able to move quickly and, and deal with it rather than being stuck in this, almost like this kind of freeze response, this heightened tension that they say it stops us being creative, it stops us seeing options, we get reactive rather than responsive. And yeah, nothing good comes from stress. You know, as Mark likes to say, it makes us dumb, conservative and mean, which is like, none of those are useful for being, for humaning, let alone like running a business or being a coach or (laughs) doing anything else in the world. Not that there's anything wrong with being politically conservative necessarily, but but yes. No, no, no. Conservative yeah. is in uh, uh, uncreative and like sticking uh, to what, sticking to what is familiar. Small got it. Rather than rather yeah. than being more uh, courageous and um, yeah, yeah. and ad- adventurous, you know, which, yeah, which is which is what work. which is what we need. Uh, many of us watching, you know, what, here are solopreneurs, and we need to continually be exercising our creativity or courage or, or courage. And um, okay, so you there's something else you talk about um, that you work with. You have a, you've had programs on this, which is cyclical, like the idea of cyclical mm-hmm. living or cyclical being mm-hmm. and rhythms. So yeah. how does that relate to perfectionism? I think a lot of people who are watching this understand the the value of um, paying attention to cycles. Mm-hmm. Uh, our own cycles, body cycles, etc. So, so yeah, how does that work with perfectionism? Yeah, so I like to talk about it in two ways. One is kind of like a permission slip. So it's like for me, cyclical living. So I work a lot with my menstrual cycle, but you can apply this to any cycle. It's yeah, like I don't have menstrual cycles as far as I know, but <laughs> it's like the permission to be to be who I am in any phase of a cycle. So there are times mm-hmm. where I am really expressive and energetic and I want to do all of the things and then there are times where I want to curl up under the duvet hide and never come out and and cyclical living helps me kind of understand that experience and it gives me permission to have it it's like okay yeah I'm bleeding or I'm in the winter of a cycle I'm tired of course I want to hide under the duvet or no I'm in like the, the inner summer of a of a project of course I feel expressive and this is where I want to be um so that's one way I think about this permission slip. And the other is, is kind of an instruction manual. So I think a lot of recovering perfectionists are like desperate to be told, like, what is the right thing to do? <laughs> and, you know, there, there is no right way. But I sometimes think about cyclical living as being like my own internal instruction manual. Like when I pay attention to where I am in a cycle, so it doesn't tell me that I have to be a certain way, like the should is a red flag to watch out for, or, you know, I I don't feel how I should feel. It's like, okay, I'm in my summer. My my cycle awareness practice gives me the instruction manual. How do I best support myself? Like what are the self-care practices, as Red School calls them, for this phase of a cycle? So how can I better support myself where I am? And it, it is, it's like having this little blueprint um especially you know if you build up a practice over time this is something you pay attention to you can kind of like develop your own instruction manual and and I I I love that like I just I feel so much kind of ease in my body and like I don't have to figure this out every day all I need to do is pay attention to what my cycles are telling me and act with that rather than resisting it wow it's so empowering uh, the more we can sense into our cycles. And, and so this, you know, as being someone who likes to plan, um, mm-hmm. 
knowing your cycles better and better, I imagine helps you to plan better and better um, to be able to have a more, I could say predictable because, because cycles means that there is a returning, there mm -hmm. is a, there's a pattern and yeah. the patterns uh, as we study them and we kind of zoom out and look at them means that there's some predictability to it. Right. I mean, the example of a menstrual cycle, I mean, it's, it's more or less predictable, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so allow, so, so having the understanding of your cycles, does that mean that you can plan better and um, for the for the recovering perfectionist, does that mean that there are, I guess, certain days of the month, of the week, times of the day, you know, months of the year, where mm -hmm. where we might want to lean more into our work, we might want to be a, more aware of our rest, and be aware of our perfectionism, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I mean, this will vary for everybody, and cycles are, I think, are fun because they're fractal. So, you know, there's always cycles within mm. cycles. So, how I feel, you know, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning here, midway through the week. So, I'm in the beginning of my day, but it's the middle of the week. It's, you know, technically southern hemisphere, so it's technically autumn. And like the way that feels compared to, you know, had we had this conversation at this time three months ago might have felt quite quite different because different cycles are interplaying. So, so yes, there can be an element of more predictability, but it's really an, in, it's an awareness practice. It's an invitation to notice how am I in this moment and how can I respond to myself with more grace and ease rather than beating myself up more. Um, but I would say for most recovering perfectionists, autumns, transitions either way are, are, are tricky like winters and summers are relatively easy because you know where you are right it's like you think about it um with the weather especially somewhere like the uk you know winter like it's going to be cold and wet summer it's probably going to be fairly nice go to the uk this time of year and you'll need a jumper an umbrella sun cream um, you know like you will experience all four seasons in the day and so transitions can be wobbly but autumns particularly um as the season of completion is the home of the inner critic and so particularly if you're somebody who doesn't have a good relationship with your inner critic like I find autumn's autumn is not a good time for me to create yeah that's a spring summer activity autumn is about editing discerning and letting go like an inner critic in spring or summer is like a frost it will come in and it will destroy all of your like seedling ideas because nothing's ever good enough for an inner critic so so yeah it's it's worth kind of paying attention to not trying to create at times when your inner critic is running rampant this is so good yeah um i, I love that you've given language to it yeah uh, you know this the summer autumn winter etc is that is that the kind of language you 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 tend to use with clients as well when you're helping them study their own cycles um understand their own perfectionism and how they're coping with it Yes, because there's something intuitive. Like we, even if you're you haven't grown up somewhere that has this kind of like four seasons model, most people have an intuitive understanding of of what that what that means. Um, and then yeah, you can apply these sort of inner seasons archetypes to to any cycle. Any cycle has a period of getting started, a spring, a period of being on, a summer, a period of closing down, autumn, and then a period of being off which again is a period that most of us kind of skip entirely because we go straight from doing straight back into, into something else without giving us this, um, you know, I think you talk about this in joyful productivity, you know, taking the little breaks throughout the day, having a little energy reboot, giving yourself a breath. Before, okay. Right now, what am I, what am I moving on to next? What am, what's the next cycle going to store for me? Yeah, really good. And the, the, this, like, I love, like love that you said earlier, I think one emphasizes the cycles are fractal and so it's like even in a single hour you might say that there is a there's a bit of a spring summer mm -hmm. autumn winter right yeah. and and um it's powerful and to kind of think of it in that way like that winter is the sort of like it's letting the light uh, the land lie fallow and um you know there's there's actually a lot of uh growth potential there and but we need to let it rest and you know but this is really profound and i think there i think your clients are lucky to be able to work with you in 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 these ways um 
there's a there's a really rich i think this is really rich work and you know impactful for people um so i would love for you to talk about how you do help people how do you work with clients your students uh, program members that kind of thing uh, of course you've written a book uh, recently congratulations on that um but yeah tell us more about your your current offerings yeah, so uh, right now I'm doing a lot of one to work. I've got one, uh, availability for one to one work. Yeah. Um, I'm teaching a lot of authentic relating, so kind of an embodied practice to help people connect with others and themselves. Um, I, I run group programs from time to time. Um, at this point, as time of recording, I'm not entirely sure what the next one is going to be, but there is something emerging around cycles for sure. Um, but what I, I do is um, I run monthly free to attend workshops, touching on lots of topics. So the last one I did was actually on how to be consistent and on a cycles. Um, so people are very welcome to come along to those um, or uh, jump on me, jump on a call with me for a bit of free coaching in exchange for telling me about your experience of perfectionism. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for that availability. I will be putting the links below. Some people will be watching this uh, into the future where maybe some of these offerings will have changed, but uh, mm -hmm. certainly I'll, your website will be below and people can yeah. reach out to you there. Um, just a little bit more on how you how you enjoy working with clients. So um, tell me, tell us about like an example of a uh, you could say ideal client or typical client who might come to you, um, what kind of project might they be stuck on or perfectionistic about? And mm -hmm. what's the general sort of like map or kind of like framework that you, that you work with them on? Yeah. Um, so like on the last iteration of one of my group programs, uh, which is called get it done. Um, I had people kind of coming uh, somebody who, I felt really stuck with their website um, and kind of like wanted to get going on that. Somebody else who uh, was stuck writing their book. Um, somebody else just had this, the kind of the intuitive sense of like, I, I'm not doing the things that I want to be doing them doing and I don't feel the way I want to feel as I'm doing them. So yeah, it tends to be like either specific things or just this, I think the question one of my clients ask is like, surely, surely it could be easier, but I don't know how. And I'm a bit scared that if it's easier, it won't be as good. Um, that's where a lot of people are at. And so I, all of my work is based on cycles. So when I do a group program, there is a very clear, like we, we work with the different seasons um, in the program. So we build in rest and time for integration. Um, and I take people through like how to connect to their their core needs because I think when you're acting from a place of getting your needs fulfilled, like that's what makes life feel feel fulfilling and satisfying. Um, emergent planning, so kind of like be in this place of I call it. Um, this comes from Jocelyn K. Gly, a tender discipline. Like how do you hold the polarity of both needing to get stuff done? and being gentle with yourself. And what does that look like through emergent planning? Um, in, embodying perfectionism, regulating nervous system, we do a lot of inner critic work, um, and, and then a lot of work to help people kind of uh, do endings well. Like recovering perfectionists, um, particularly overachievers, are not very good at endings, not very good yeah. at resting. So like helping people like bring in things to an end well so that they can rest without the guilt. Right. Right. Exactly. That's the key. Right. That's awesome. I'm really grateful to hear these examples and kind of like these tools and these um, sort of like shifts that you help people through. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, Vix, thank you so much for the work you do and for this conversation. I think it was helpful and interesting for me, and I think it'll be helpful and interesting for others as well. So um, yeah. So folks, if you're interested, you know, if you want to look more into Vix's content and offerings, look at the links below. So thanks again, Vix. Thanks, George.